So let me first offer you a welcome. My name is Norman Beer, I'm the Associate Director at the Open Learning Initiative here at Carnegie Mellon. I'm joined by Jean Runyon, the Dean of Learning Assessment at the virtual campus at Anne Arundel Community College, and Janet Polovich, who is the STEM Bridge Lead for the National STEM Consortium, also at Anne Arundel Community College. We are pretty excited to be talking here at the end of Open Education Week. And um, looking down the list of attendees, I definitely see a few familiar names, some familiar because you've contributed to the project, and some because I think we've crossed paths any number of times here in the open education world. Uh, so again, welcome. The reason that we're talking about the project, and I'm giving you an overview of National STEM Consortium's work, uh, has to do why we're talking about it here now for Open Education Week has a lot to do with how we approach this question of what represents an open educational resource and how our approach relates to what's become a larger federal commitment to making sure that resources that are developed with federal funding are going to be made freely and openly available. And so we're going to be diving more into the details on this. I think that looking at the list of folks that are attending here, you all have a decent sense of what it is that we think about as open educational resources. Um, and similarly, you know, if you haven't heard yet, the, the uh, U.S. government has been making an ongoing commitment that, that, that continues to increase, I think, in recognizing both the importance of OER uh, as part of the infrastructure for learning, but also in making this a requirement for funding as we move forward. And so as part of our work inside of the uh, TACT grant and the Department of Labor grant, we have a commitment here that any materials that we're building as part of our program are going to be made available as open educational resources as part of a CC BY. And I think this, this ends up being something fairly unique, that what the National STEM Consortium is building or what we'll end up with at the end of this process is not just a module or a course that's going to be available openly, but we're going to have a set of full career track programs, five programs that are going to be implemented in a common way across a common platform, all of which are going to be openly licensed. And I think that this is exceptionally exciting. Um, and I also think it shows uh, what you can do when you approach the question of open as a foregone conclusion when you start doing your planning, you start doing your development. Um, this is just part of the foundation that we're building on rather than needing to be something special. That said, I'm going to turn the slideshow over, and Janet's going to talk to you a little bit about the specifics of the TACT grant, and then move into talking to you about the NSC's uh, goals in this. Janet? Well, actually, it's Jean. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to kind of give you an overview of, of just the TACT grant program. Um, we are very pleased to be awarded an almost $20 million grant for the National STEM Consortium back in October uh, 2011. Um, and as part of that, as um, Norm mentioned too, as, as a condition of being a recipient of this grant, we're required to make sure that all of the work that we produce um, is, is a CC by license as well. And I think it really set the stage for us to have some discussions about what this means, what, um, what OERs are all about, to really introduce it to the faculty and staff who are involved with this, this grant. And as part of that, I think, to also begin to disseminate more information about um, you know, where you find open content. Um, how what the, the licenses actually mean, um, and actually how it's uh, an opportunity to not only to create and adapt and adopt, but also to share back as part of what we're doing. We have several institutions that are uh, working with us as part of the NSC grant, um, and we've met several times face to face, but most of the work does be, uh, take place virtually, and we're very pleased to be able to partner um, with these institutions on the National STEM Consortium. And the role of the National STEM Consortium really is to design and deliver um, programs that are nationally portable, high quality certificate level content, and specifically responsive to labor department needs. And as a hope um, as going not only just developing the curricula that supports um, some of these STEM areas, we're really hoping and we are building a national model for multi-college cooperation. And we're hoping what lessons learned can also uh, support others who are working on, on grants or even on projects of national significance as well. Um, and as part of the um, developing the certificate programs, um, we want to 
wanted to really identify who will be the participants, who will be the benefit of this development of the curriculum. And we'll be working with uh, workers who really need to have some updated skills. And you can see that we'll be working with dislocated workers, underemployed workers, um, and others to not only provide them with the content and the processes, but also um, to focus on the employability piece as well. Um, and we have two main goals. One, we are going to be designing new curricula built for completion in the STEM pathways, um, and that work is well underway. And a second piece of the uh, project was to develop a STEM bridge program that will support the learners um, in remediation, um, building their math skills, reading skills, computer skills, critical thinking skills, so that the learners who participate in these programs are also very likely to be successful because they have the support that's built into the process as well. And so these are two of our primary goals. And what makes uh, the National STEM Consortium unique is that we are working with compressed schedules. We are actively building and designing for completion, um, developing one-year certificate programs, and we'll also have that STEM bridge a as a piece as well. Uh, Peter Gray, who's um, actually participating today, um, is working with us, and he is a well-known expert in learning outcomes assessment. Um, and he is working with each of the colleges and the teams to make sure that the content um, that we're using aligns with the objectives, that the assessments are aligned, the activities are aligned, Aligned because we want to be able to demonstrate the curriculum, all the pieces work together so the students can be successful. We are building for completion. Um, and again, the STEM bridge is a, a very important piece of, of that project as well. And so uh, we have different institutions working with us in um, some of the certificate areas. One is composite materials, and we have a target enrollment of almost 400 uh, through the, the grant period. Cyber technology, again, we have several colleges working with us not only to develop the content, but also to um, use that content and to launch it at their institutions. So cyber technology with a target enrollment of uh, 250. Electrical vehicle de development and repair, um, you can see the targets for them. We, as part of this, we have two tracks, one for development and also for service. And then environmental technology, again, two tracks, water quality and health and safety with a target enrollment of 360 participants. Mechatronics, target enrollment 341. And so we are very, very pleased to be able to partner with these institutions. And as I mentioned, um, the focus is on student success and completion and also job placement. And the STEM bridge is an important part of that. So I'm going to turn this over to Janet, who's going to talk about the STEM bridge piece. Um, hello, everyone. Um, one of the most interesting pieces, at least from my perspective, for, for the whole project is that each of the STEM pathways is going to include a STEM bridge. Um, the challenge is that it's got to be programmatically consistent across all five of the technical fields, and we need to integrate basic skills, workforce skills, computer skills, and job readiness contextualized within the pathway. So it's it's quite a big, big challenge for the team, but I think we're up to it. Um, Basically, the target population with the TAA or dislocated worker may um, has identified that many of the students may need immediate strengthening of rusty math, reading, writing, critical thinking competencies. As we've begun the development of this curriculum, I look back on how many years ago I was in high school and some of the math is very, very um, faded in my memory. So we're looking at targeting this uh, population with some very um, innovative strategies to help refresh those basic skills um, in the pathways. The, when we first started the project, we surveyed the five technical teams building the, um, the STEM pathway programs to identify the key skills that they would need in the STEM bridge. And they've identified the key skills including math, critical thinking, workplace communication, reading, writing, and professional skills on the job. Um, Next, we were very fortunate to be able to partner with Carnegie Mellon's Open Learning Initiative and CAST to develop an innovative online 45-hour STEM readiness course. So I'm going to turn it back over to Norman to talk to you a little bit about how we were selected for this support and what OLI and CAST bring to the table. Thanks, Janet. 
So when the uh, Department of Labor grants were first announced, there were a number of conversations going on with folks in the open education community since the grants were specifically targeted at consortia of community colleges. The question was there's an awful lot of expertise both in education and specifically in the, uh, in the open ed world that would be useful to provide to grantees. How can we make this happen? The Open Learning Initiative cast Washington State Board and Creative Commons ended up coming together to create an organization that we're calling OPEN, the Open Professionals Education Network. And we received some funding from the Gates Foundation to specifically provide a number of different types of services to tax grantees. So we're thinking about those in three different ways. Uh, at its core, there's this notion of best practices, which are available for all projects. And these are going to be ranging from understanding of uh, learning science research and scientific method to development and evaluation to folks that need some additional support and assistance on the open policy side of equations or on understanding the licensing. And these are places where Washington State and Creative Commons have really been able to leverage their expertise. In addition to these services that any grantees are able to take advantage of, we had a, uh, a number of different tiers that we were able to provide to a smaller group. And so these are Platform Plus. Uh, 25 projects are selected to work with OLI and implement their courses on OLI's platform, take advantage of our uh, data gathering and feedback loop capabilities. And lastly, for three projects, we wanted to really help support folks in developing OER collaboratively. Uh, the Open Learning Initiative and CAST have some pretty specific and successful approaches to uh, open content development. And we wanted to work with some partners to identify places where there were going to be high in demand courses and work with them to do a full on OLI course. We ended up working, so, so what does this get you, I think, is the, uh, is the question. And I'll dive into that in a second. But as we were looking across the projects to identify potential partners in this work, we had uh, a couple of criteria. But one of them is who's building materials that are going to see broad use and broad need. And this is one of the places that the National STEM Consortium really stood out to us, that we felt that this work on the STEM bridge side of things was clearly something that we kept hearing a need for from lots of different grantees. We also thought that this new approach to remediation of embedding it inside of the uh, ongoing career track rather than sending students off for developmental classes was pretty exciting and was an interesting research opportunity. But we also were hoping to identify some potential partners that would be interested in implementing the rest of their program into Platform Plus because we do feel that there are some capabilities that will be there as we're able to develop out a full program track that would really uh, constitute more than the sum of the parts and build something new and exciting. As we talked with a number of different partners, the NSC just kept standing out to us as folks that were excited about taking this approach, that would be developing materials that we think would have broad use, uh, that were really interested in working with us, and that had a pretty strong sense of managing and working with a larger consortium. So I think that this has been one of the challenges across the TAC grantee is that this requirement for consortia has led to some additional overhead in terms of making for um, successful partnerships. And um, this was a place where NSC really stood out to us. So we've been talking to them to say, is this interesting to you? you know, we'd love to work with you. And through a number of cycles of back and forth, we ended up choosing them as both a Platform Plus participant and as our first co-development participant. On the Platform Plus side, one of the things that this gets you is access to the OLI system. We know that one of the most powerful features of web-based instruction is the ability to capture every student interaction uh, and treat every student interaction as an assessment opportunity. We're able to use these assessment opportunities to drive powerful feedback loops, get information back to the student about their performance, misconceptions, or give them help as needed, and similarly give information to faculty so that in hybrid approaches, faculty are able to better understand student knowledge state and adapt their practice as appropriate. The same set of information can help us to iteratively improve courses and with a large enough data set feedback into the larger science of learning. And so to date, this capability within the OLI platform had been limited to specifically OLI development teams. And from a Platform Plus approach, this was really going to be opening up these capabilities to a larger audience. One of the things that folks uh, tend to get most excited about is that feedback loop to instructor activities. Uh, what you're looking at here is the, the major outcome of that feedback loop, tool that we call the 
learning dashboard for instructors. Uh, this is built on the work of one of our researchers here at Carnegie Mellon, Marsha Lovett. And so sitting underneath of this is a cognitive model that's doing some work in predicting current student mastery level. Every OLI course is composed of a set of student-centered measurable learning objectives. What the dashboard is going to be doing is giving an estimate on whether or not a student is able to achieve those outcomes. Red are a population of students that are really struggling to get there. Yellow, students that are making some progress but haven't yet demonstrated mastery. And green are the students that we would predict, if you were to give them an assessment, would pass that assessment right now. You can imagine this is a fairly powerful tool in the hands of faculty, giving you an unprecedented look at student current knowledge state. See that students seem to be doing okay in the areas for the first two outcomes. But as we move down into the uh, third, fourth, and fifth. This is clearly an area where you want to pay some more attention. And so you're able to drill down, see who the students are that sit in each of these different populations, identify what these sub-outcomes are that are leading to this evaluation, and then drill down a level further to see what are the questions that are uh, causing these kinds of problems, what kind of answers are students giving, and really leverage your expertise as an educator to say, all right, I know that when students answer questions in this way, this is where they're getting off track. These are the kind of misconceptions they're exhibiting. And so this is the kind of work I'm going to do in class to try to adjust for that. Platform Plus participants are going to be given access to the tools to build these types of um, dashboards and to use those, that, that same data for iterative improvement. As we move into the co-development side, we also take on some of the larger pieces of the OLI approach. I think one of the core pieces to this is our team-based approach to design and development. Frequently, when folks talk about building OER or talk about putting a course online, they're often talking about putting the work of an individual faculty member online. So this phrase, I want to put my course out there. I'd like to create my open educational resource. Within OLI, we feel that this kind of work is actually best done as a team. And so what we want to do is take that faculty domain and teaching expertise Treat that expertise with care and respect, but also recognize that it's only one expertise that would be useful in developing the best set of scientifically based learning materials possible. So we also want to bring to bear some other expertises, an understanding of how users interact with computers, strong work in learning science and instructional technology, um, close attention to universal design for learning, which is one of the things that the CAS team is bringing to this work. Frequently, as we try to understand how to best leverage the affordances of technology, we'll need some help on the software development side. And lastly, when you start working with a team of this size, you definitely need someone on the project management side that can also combine that expertise on the learning science and uh, instructional design side. From a larger perspective, this core development team is going to allow us to develop out a set of materials um, you know, more effectively than any one single individual could. These materials can be based on learning science. And we can continue that scientific approach by getting these materials out in front of other experts and getting them out in front of students, collecting data on how those students are learning, and using that information to continue to improve and adapt the course. The STEM Bridge course is explicitly our first co-development effort. And so we are in the middle of this process. And it's been really exciting to see it at work with such a large population of institutions and individuals contributing to the materials. OK, um, Norman, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the two strategies that the Stembridge team has taken in development of the embedded remediation for the STEM certificates. The first thing is this development of this 45-hour course. It's designed to run during the one-year certificate programs to provide that immediate strengthening of the rusty skills. We are very fortunate to have some key industry partners that are helping us develop real-life workplace scenarios. And I want to uh, mention that we are incredibly collaborative in the development of this. I have members on the Stembridge team from all 10 of the colleges in nine different states. We have math faculty and um, English faculty and all, all different types of people. Technical team members are serving as part of the Stembridge team to bring their expertise to this project. Um, the first focus as we, after we surveyed the technical teams was 
everyone needed math. So we wanted to refresh basic math skills up through beginning algebra, and we decided to start with that first. So the first 15 hours of the, of the course are already built in Platform Plus. Norm will demonstrate that in a little while. Um, basically, we started with a uh, module two and three are uh, rusty. And Sue Gallagher, he just got a job um, at a composites factory, and the changes in his income have changed his budget. So we are practicing basic arithmetic in terms of a family budget. We move into measuring systems, and we did that with the um, cooperation of a composites manufacturer, and we, we built that out with a scenario around a composites factory. We did a, a follow-on module five with algebraic expressions with measuring systems and followed that um, scenario in the composites factory. Module six in, in charts and graphs, we looked at an environmental scenario. We looked at data and data sets in a power plant that might possibly be polluting water in a local um, community. And we finished off in the um, math module with beginning algebra, and we did that in context of applying algebra in the design of electric vehicles. We are currently under development of the critical thinking workplace communication modules. And the first four modules, we are working with a local defense contractor in Annapolis, Maryland uh, called Air Inc. They have been fantastic to give us real life critical thinking workplace communication examples of how a technician would be responding to and help desk situations in the aviation industry. We have just identified a mechatronics partner uh, through our partnership at uh, College of Lake County, and we will be working with them to build out the second part of this module in a mechatronics environment. The third 15 hours will be completed by and ready for delivery by late summer for um, the third semester, which will start in the fall for the one-year cohort that began in January. The way this rolls out is that the January cohort starts with math. In the second term of their one-year program, they will do the critical thinking workplace communication. And by the third term, they will be ready for professional skills before they graduate in December. And each time we begin a cohort class, these materials will be available for the teams to insert as they as they see fit in their program. Professional skills will, will um, go into great deal, detail in organizational skills, time management, professional image, teamwork, conflict res resolution. And we are looking um, to partner with our industry partners and our advisory board to help us build these out in the most realistic way possible. Um, the, the wonderful thing about using the Platform Plus system is that these components can be delivered by the colleges in the way that suits them best. They can set them a hybrid format. They can have a face-to-face -face instructor do companion materials along with the STEM course. We could have it only online in an attached lab. Um, they could deliver it all up front. We've, uh, we've actually recommended that the teams deliver the math course in the first two to three weeks of the fir first term so that students can refresh their math skills very quickly before they move into the content for the rest of the technical um, curriculum. And I'm going to turn it over to Norman for a course demonstration now. Norman, are you are you going to do the demo now? I am. I was talking without uh, turning on my microphone, which is not actually <laughs> especially helpful. Apologies, everyone. Let me see if I can't turn on the ability to All right. Um, are we currently sharing? Is everyone able to see my web browser? I can see it, Norm. Great. All right. I'm going to start off here. What you're looking at is the course sitting inside of the OLI learning environment. And OLI can be used in either standalone mode, if you don't have an LMS to take advantage of, or if you do have an LMS, we're actually able for most modern learning management systems to connect via basic LTI. So you're able to include the course as a learning object inside of your own platform. 
Um, this allows us to continue capturing the data and using some of our tools while also making the experience pretty transparent to your students and faculty. Uh, another area that the National STEM Consortium has helped lead the way on is that almost all of the institutions involved, all but one, have been using this uh, LTI connection to their learning management system. The system designed uh, to keep our learning objectives front and center. So you're going to see these repeating throughout the course. And we also have a navigation scheme that's designed to try to give the students a sense of what the course structure is without giving them the entire structure at once. And so you know, this allows them to move to the areas that are sort of near to the things that they're learning, but puts things that aren't immediately relevant to a little more of a distant place. The modules are going to begin with a scenario. And you know, what we've worked pretty hard with is to embed the skills that we're teaching, especially on these STEM bridge skills, in common life and workplace scenarios. Um, we've also, and so we do this throughout each of the courses, excuse me, throughout each of the modules. Students are going to walk through the scenario and then move into some of the learning materials. As the students walk through, they're going to be first presented with their learning outcomes and then presented with some set of activities. Sometimes this is exposition images. Other times it's going to be an actual activity that's going to allow them to interact with uh, the, the activity and the outcome that they're trying to achieve. Students are going to be given direct and immediate feedback in this context of solving these problems. So we think of this as a learn by doing opportunity. This is a place where we do not expect the student to get things right the first time. We do expect them to interact and need some feedback in this case. And so this is really a safe place for them to make mistakes. One of the things that you also note here, we've worked very carefully with CAST to implement what we think of as the universal design for learning principles. This is really a core part of their framework. And it's a fancy way of saying that we need to account for learner variability. Uh, frequently, you know, we, we hear folks talking about the need to be compliant and accessible. And we think that this is important. But simply focusing on accessibility requirements actually doesn't recognize the fact that really all of us have different approaches as we learn and that there's extensive learner variability uh, across the entire population of college students. And this is especially true among those students that are going to be returning to work. If you design for this larger approach to variability, not only are you going to be taking care of some of the accessibility concerns, but you're also developing a better learning experience. And so some of the ways that this stands out, obviously things like alt tags, but also making sure that we have alternate versions for students that are going to need to encounter or work with this information in different modalities. As students work through the uh, activities, once they move through learn by doing activities, there comes a point where we expect that they really ought to have gotten this. Since we approach this as a, did I get this uh, opportunity? It's an attempt to develop student metacognitive skills and really show them that you know at this point you really ought to have had this. Do you have it yet? Work through. Answer the question for yourself. And if you're running into problems, you really should take a chance to step back and reevaluate. Do you need to go back and rework some of the earlier sets of materials? In addition to uh, having some of these challenges embedded in workplace scenarios, we also try to embed these in some specific life and applicable ones. And so in this case, we're working through some work with pay stubs and uh, applying operations to you know, what's happening in your paycheck. Frequently with learning, learn by doing opportunities, we're, we're not expecting students to be able to accomplish these tasks quite yet. And so in addition to offering rich and targeted feedback, we also want to be able to offer some robust hints for the student and uh, you know, really walk the student through this process that we're trying to teach them. And then see the same set of materials across each of the modules. And each of the modules, in addition to the extensive set of learning activities, which we can think of as summative assessment, is also going to end with a high stakes event a set of quiz questions that the student can use uh, to self-evaluate. Or as these are being integrated into the classroom, you can also use this as a actual 
visual graded piece of work. The entire course is going to feed into our learning dashboard. Comes that have been stated in the course. Get that picture of where, where your class is as a whole and where do individual students up as they're evaluated against these outcomes. For those students that seem to be struggling, you can drill a little deeper, see what are the activities that they've interacted with, and better advise them either by some additional class activities or by suggesting that they go back and rework some of these materials. That's just a quick demo. If you are interested, uh, give me just a moment and to return to the slide. Uh, maybe I'm going to return to the slide. I'm going to uh, apologize here. Is there anyone else on the moderators list that knows how to turn off uh, application sharing on Collaborate? Because I'm missing the link for it. Hopefully. Uh, hopefully that corrects the audio problems. So that's a quick demonstration, but I haven't gone into a lot of depth there. Um, there's obviously a lot more material than we're able to take advantage of. So what I encourage you to do is head to the website and take a look at the course. Um, Right, so I actually uh, I'm, I'm, I've returned to the slide deck. Uh, I actually found the uh, button, thanks. And so we're going to uh, move back to the slideshow. Um, so what we'd like to encourage you to do is go take a look at the course. The first unit of this course is already openly and freely available on our website. You can go in and you can even uh, assign it to your students as an independent learner. And if you'd like to dig in and learn more, you can head to oli.cmu.edu. In addition, um, if you'd like to incorporate this into your practice, you can also do that. Your faculty are able to go in and create an instance of the course, and they'll then get advantage, take advantage of the grade book, the high stakes assessments, and obviously the learning dashboard piece. We've actually already seen uh, faculty from four different institutions who are not a part of the National STEM Consortium who have gone in to create courses and do some additional exploration work. I'm going to turn the slideshow back over at this point. Thank you, Norman. Um, I'll let Janet take over right here with our second strategy, and then I'll have a chance to wrap up on really, I guess, the, the applications uh, and a little summary of the grant. So, Janet? Janet, are you able to take over about the strategy for um, Stembridge? I've been, I was trying to talk, and I'm sorry, I've been experiencing technical difficulty. The system actually dropped me out for a second and then brought me back in. I apologize. Um, the Stembridge team has two strategies. The first is to build the OLI course to support the learners who are going directly into the STEM certificates. However, this is not going to be enough. We know that many of these workers have um, skills that may not even be, they'll be more than rusty. They, they may not have ever had them before. So we need to design something that will help support them in the lower levels, quickly build the skills so they can get ready to go into the certificates with the embedded OLI course. Basically, we will we'll be looking at multiple entry points. So if you look at this diagram, college-ready students and higher-level developmental students in the green will go straight into the one-year certificates with the embedded OLI STEM readiness course. Dislocated workers with lower-level skills need some kind of on-ramp or fast track into the certificates. So we're looking at some kind of stackable modules, stackable um, materials. We just had a Stembridge face-to-face -face meeting here in Baltimore this week, and we've got some really exciting information to share with you on that. We've decided that we're also going to develop curriculum and resources to help colleges meet the needs of lower-level learners by building uh, by identifying 
specific learning outcomes identified at lesson program and bundle level so that we can crosswalk these learning outcomes directly to developmental class outcomes and bundle this content in any way that best meets the needs of each individual college in the consortium. So we're going to work as a team to create these materials. We will ultimately put these materials in addition to the Stembridge course that you saw already. We'll put a lot of these materials in OLI's Platform Plus as well. The curricula that we are developing here for the lower level learners are envisioned as a resource that the colleges can use as a whole or in part to strengthen the skills of those lower level learners. Uh, what we've done is we've identified the first two, Arithmetic 1 and 2 modules in the OLI STEM Readiness course will be recommended for use with the lower level student population. We are actually implementing in the next cohort a placement test for that math piece that you, you just saw so that students who may, may not need the real fundamental uh, arithmetic refreshment can go into a higher level portion of the course. We're already talking about adding two additional modules with some more complex mathematical um, um, concepts and triangle, triangles and, and other things that some of the technical teams need. So we will build out a, a couple of additional modules in the arithmetic. We're also going to develop a curriculum toolkit for each school on um, how they can implement fast tracks. And we could also tie all of these uh, curriculum modules together into their very own special developmental courses. And we've talked to our financial aid office, and there is a way to tie them together into the STEM pathway as a new accelerated developmental piece. So we can actually block them. And you'll see here a visual representation of how we would maybe block all of the content we're going to develop for the lower level learners into maybe four 45 hour credit equivalent developmental modules, but we would run them in a very accelerated format. So for example, they would go to STEM 01, 02, 03, and 04 at the same, on the same day, um, Monday through Thursday for eight weeks or 10 weeks and really brush up on, on the content. So um, the idea is that what we develop in um, the first part of our strategy with the STEM readiness course under development with OLI, that is for the higher level learners. But we're going to go and build something for lower level learners. And all of it will have flexibility for the colleges to, to bundle and put in where they need to put it to support the learners so that we don't have them spending a year or two in developmental ed before they come into the, to the STEM certificate. So I'm going to turn it back over to Jean. Thank you. Just wanted to kind of share some of the key takeaways, and I, I think the components that really stand out for us, you know, working together. part of the National STEM Consortium. First of all, I mean, we are very privileged to be able to work with so many community colleges. And this has truly been a very collaborative, collegial process. Faculty working with faculty, really committed to um, you know, student success, producing curricula to support the, the, the development of the certificates. Um, and we have been very, very pleased with uh, the industry partnerships. I mean, it truly is industry working with us um, to develop the curriculum that supports these students so that they will be employable and, and the best prepared graduates of the world. Um, also, I, one of the key takeaways and one thing I was most excited about was really having an opportunity to, to work with Norm and um, Carnegie Mellon. And Norm doesn't know this, but we were sitting in a room having a phone conference, kind of sharing a little bit about our project and as, as uh, Norm and others were looking at um, different groups and, you know, actually going to kind of decide who they're going to work with. And we were going, oh, please, Norm, choose us, choose us. Because as part of working with Carnegie Mellon, we knew that we had an opportunity to kind of rethink how we teach our traditional students, our students in our blended courses, our online courses. Um, because using working with Carnegie, looking using learning science, research-based uh, pedagogy, to me it was like really frame-breaking. It was like I was so excited thinking, this is really 
where we need to go, and working with faculty to kind of understand um, the next uh, phase, I think, of uh, really teaching our learners, and so how we can actually teach using data um, in such a timely way to really make informed decisions about how we teach and, and how we um, can really support that student's success. So for me, that was like, wow, this is like a gift. And so thank you, uh, Norm. And I really think going forward, this, is, this will have an impact on um, our faculty and also our students and re help us rethink how we teach in the future. Um, as Norm said, you know, um, whenever we design content, we are always concerned about the making sure content is, you know, designed for universal design, um, ADA compliance, and learner veritability. And that was so, I think, so important, um, another product or byproduct of this participation. And I think for us to kind of bring it back to why we're here today, um, sometimes, you know, there may be a little bit difficult on college campuses to introduce OER, to have OER accepted, um, discoverable. And this has allowed us to really gain broad engagement, broad discussions about the use of OER, not only using content that's open and available, but also creating content um, that's shareable uh, with others as well. And then that student success piece, I mean, we are really designing just um, thinking about that student success completion um, piece from the very beginning, making sure the content is firmly uh, grounded in learning outcomes assessment and methodology to really create that learning environment that's conducive for the success of, of our learners. The transferability, scalability, replicability of the content is so, in, so important because, you know, as you're looking maybe at the STEM bridge, I'm hoping some of you are thinking, gosh, I could use that STEM bridge, or maybe I would love to use that math content, but maybe work with different industry to create scenarios that support those concepts. And so it, it is replicable as well. Um, and then, you know, we are building those certificates and the content will be available in Platform Plus. And as part of that, the faculty are working to develop sample syllabi, lesson plans, um, instructor resources, so that others can take that content and adapt it for use at their home institutions. Um, and then, of course, we've showcased the um, the STEM piece, which is, as I'm hoping some of you can see, that it is adaptable, adoptable. Um, you can use it, but also maybe tweak it for use at your own uh, college campus. So this has just been an amazing project. I mean, we're just um, really in the beginning phases, but I do think that um, just the processes working together with the colleges, with uh, Carnegie Mellon, Norm, um, and others, will really create um, um, a project that I think is scalable and can be replicated by others as well. So I'm going to turn this back over to Janet and Norm just for some, uh, and then you all can ask some questions. So we'll be happy. We have about five or so minutes that we'd be happy to answer some questions you might have. So if you do, just raise your hand. And we'll be glad to, um, to take those questions. Again, I think that. Uh, We've been thrilled to find such a fantastic partner with the National STEM Consortium. Um, hey, I'll turn this over to you know, just uh, in terms of what this kind of means in the open education space. This really piece, feels and then like he'll turn the, it over to Janet for a final uh, wrap up. The delivery on a long promise that we've made that when you bring together multiple groups and multiple stakeholders that are committed to an open approach to development, delivery, and reuse, that you can do amazing things. And between the commitment that we've seen from uh, the Department of Labor to ensure that the investment they're making leads to open resources, the commitment on the part of the partners to live up to that, and frankly on the, uh, on the part of the Gates Foundation to help make sure that we're able to implement best practices on this, we're really ending up with something that's incredibly exciting. And this is this full set of program track open resources. Um, and that's thrilling. And we're really, you know, first we're excited to be getting it out in front of our students, the National STEM Consortium students. But we're also very excited to see what everyone else is going to do with this and what kind of changes you're able to make and how you're able to implement it into your own practices. Um, every OLI course that we build is a hypothesis about how students learn. We always learn a little more about that. And uh, the, the, this is no different. We're definitely learning some things about 
this space, and um, we're, we're excited to continue to put that back into practice and continue to improve not just the course, but the larger state of the art. So, uh, and again, we welcome any questions and welcome uh, adoption of the materials. Janet, you want to uh, take over? Oh, thank you, Norm. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to every one of the members of the Stembridge team. Um, it's been an amazing opportunity to work with people from 10 colleges in nine states. We're working with CAST, with the OLI, um, Sandy Razor, who's the project manager on the OLI side in, in Norman. Everybody's just been really neat. We do a lot of stuff, and we're, we're actually building it out in Google Docs. For those of you that that, that didn't um, know kind of how we're collaborating, we're collaborating in Google Docs, and then um, the OLI team puts it over into a development server, and, and we're getting ready to put some content for Module 2, um, the Critical Thinking Workplace Communication over there, I think starting this weekend. So we do anticipate having Unit 2, Critical Thinking Workplace Communication, ready for use by mid-May. And then we're going to um, move on to the Professionalism Module, which should be ready by late summer. And then again, with the, the content for the lower level learners, we'll be starting to look at how we could put that into Platform Plus as well. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, yes, I'm uh, Una. We are starting to build the curriculum in Google Doc as the first step. Um, we collaborate there. Lots of lots of comments. We put diagrams, and it's pretty cool. Any other questions? Okay, then I guess if there. No more questions. Uh, we should wrap up. Um, would you like me to stop the recording, Norm? Sounds good.